Well, the relationship between U.S. and Pakistan has been on shaky ground the last year or so. Now, a large part of that, of course, stems from the U.S.-led mission to kill Osama bin Laden, who had been living peacefully in Abbottabad, Pakistan, for years. The U.S. neither notified Pakistani leaders nor asked for their help, which they say both angered and confused them. Things were made much worse six months later after that, uh, six months after that, when American-led airstrikes in Pakistan killed 24 Pakistani soldiers along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. In response, supply routes into Afghanistan were closed off to NATO troops. Well, last month, President Obama met with Pakistani Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Gil Gilani in South uh, Korea to try to improve relations, but now the U.S. has put a $10 million bounty on one of Pakistan's most outspoken anti-American leaders. His name is Hafiz, Hafiz Mohammed Saeed. He's the founder of the militant group, LET, believed to be behind the attacks on Mumbai, India in 2008 that killed 166 people, including six Americans. So how does this impact the reset in relations? Well, Scott Horton is a contributing editor for Harper's Magazine, and he's on with us uh, to talk more about this. Scott, uh, let's talk first about this most recent event, the bounty payment uh, by U.S. leaders. There is a line of thinking that this is intended simply to pressure Pakistan's military, which many believe is the force behind L.A.T. How effective has this been? Well, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that that's what's going on. Uh, uh, Hafiz Saeed, uh, of course, uh, he's the head of lashkar e taiba um, Lashkar Taiba has been very clearly linked to the Mumbai attack. Um, indeed, you know his uh, his control role in it uh, has also become clear, even as a result of testimony in uh, proceedings, legal proceedings in the United States. So the U.S. could have uh, put out this bounty payment a year ago, two years ago. Um, it did it now uh, as a leverage move in the course of U.S. Uh, Pakistani discussions. And was it effective? No, of course not. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, he and other Pakistani leaders laughed at it. Uh, Afi Saeed uh, summoned a press conference and, and spoke to the media. Yeah, he's been doing, it seems to me, he's been doing quite a few press conferences and public speeches. He's been appearing uh, on talk shows. Uh, he doesn't seem to be operating like a, a wanted man. Not at all. Uh, and indeed, you know, he knows uh, that, you know, he has the confidence of senior figures in the Pakistani military, not just confidence. I mean, they've been involved in funding and training uh, him and his group. Uh, so, you know, you might view them as an instrumentality of the Pakistani government, in fact. So the idea that Pakistan is going to turn them over to the United States um, that's not going to happen. Well, they've asked, uh, the Pakistani government has asked the U.S. for evidence, which they say uh, if they bring the evidence that they'll then, uh, you know, present that to their ju judiciary and give them a trial. Uh, why doesn't the U.S. do that then? Uh, because the U.S. doesn't want to surrender control over the proceedings to the Pakistanis. I think the U.S. knows that that wouldn't go anywhere. And by, and by the way, the Pakistanis have done the same thing. I mean, they, they've launched uh, legal proceedings in their courts, uh, bringing charges against leading American political figures, including uh, the director of the CIA, over drone strikes. So I think we see a lot of these games going on in courts. And the Pakistanis, frankly, don't believe that the American uh, judicial process is independent or that has integrity. And that's certainly what the Americans think about the Pakistani system. Yeah, there does seem to be a, a little bit of a trust issue between the two countries. Uh, but let's break this down, uh, this reset process. What does each country have to gain by making improved relations a priority? Well, for the United States, I think the, the, there, there are a whole series of concerns. And so one is... Uh, nuclear proliferation. I mean, Pakistan is a nuclear power. In fact, uh, by some accounts, it's the most quickly growing nuclear power in the world. Uh, another is counterterrorism measures. Uh, Pakistan is really ground central for Islamist extremism. But probably the most pressing issue right now is Afghanistan, because the U.S. is looking to implement a 2014 drawdown uh, and a, a change of its position uh, in Afghanistan. And that really cannot be done without the cooperation and support of Pakistan, which U.S. clearly doesn't have right now. And then from the Pakistani perspective, there's one overriding concern. Pakistan as a nation is bankrupt. I mean, I mean that in terms of money. There, there is not enough funds in the coffers in Pakistan to keep the government running. And it has run in the past on the basis of doles from international financial institutions. 
but largely from the United States. There's no one else that can give it money. So it, it really has an outstretched hand. I, I'm wondering um, to what extent, I, I mean, how, how fine is this line? I mean, uh, certainly we know that, that drone strikes are very common in Pakistan. I mean, what happens if Pakistan, you know, shoots down the drones? Is that it? Does nuclear war ensues? Well, I wouldn't say it would be nuclear war. Um, and, and I would say Pakistan is, is really sort of Janus based on the drones issues. So that is, so it's very, very clear that there are certain strikes that the Pakistanis approve of and others that they disapprove of. And it's a question of which group is being struck. So they don't mind striking Al Qaeda, the Uzbek terrorist groups, and a handful of others, but they're very protective of groups like, uh, uh, like LET. So there is a, there's a little bit of room for negotiation. Um, you know, would it come to some sort of military, uh, you know, uh, confrontation between the U.S. and Pakistan? We've come very, very close to that several times in the course of the last year, but I'd still say that's relatively unlikely. Um, you know, what's much more likely is the Pakistanis kicking uh, the American contractors and intelligence personnel out of their country um, and, uh, and actually taking steps to stop the drone wars. Uh, which they haven't really done so far. I mean, there's been a lot of rhetoric, but not much real action. But should they kick, uh, you know, the U.S. and NATO forces uh, that are stationed in that country, should they kick them out? I mean, wouldn't that be uh, just very crippling for the U.S.? It, it, because 2014 is still another uh, two years away. I mean, they need uh, that space. They need that area to operate, right? Yes. I mean, especially for logistics. I mean, there are two concerns. One is that the staging area for the Taliban really is right on the frontier and a lot of it on Pakistani soil. So it's right. It's a part of the theater. But the other major concern is logistics. Eighty percent of the supplies used to flow from Pakistan. And I think what we're seeing right now is a major change on that score already. That is, all this material that used to flow through Pakistan is now coming from the north. It's coming through Uzbekistan, through Russia, uh, through the Kyrgyz uh, Republic, through uh, Turkmenistan, uh, through the north. And I think that's, that's going to continue. So I think the supply route south is coming to an end. And instead, we're going to see much more material flowing through the north, through nations of the former Soviet Union. So certainly a, a, a tightrope walk here between the two countries. And, uh, you know, no matter what kind of uh, compromise or deal they come up with, uh, it's certain that the public on, in either country probably won't know most of the details of it. Uh, thank you today, Scott Horton, contributing editor for Harper's, for sharing your insight. Great to be with you.